Welcome back to Landmarks Discovered. In this episode, we'll visit two historic landscapes in the town of Palm Beach, Wells Road and North County Road. We can't talk about these two historic landscapes without talking about Ava Stotesbury. She actually is the connection between these two historic landscapes because both border the area that was previously part of the El Mirasol estate. Today, only the gate remains from the Meisner-designed mansion. And that gate can be found on North County Road, slightly north of Wells Road. Ava Stotesbury was really a trendsetter within the town. She was the first person to commission Addison Meisner to design an estate for her after the Everglades Club was opened. And we can imagine how influential her 40-acre El Mirasol estate was on the town, um, not only as a location for a lot of social activity, but also from a geographic perspective. So in 1929, when the Garden Club plan of Palm Beach was developed, Wells Road is specifically called out as an important artery within the town. And today it's really used as a demarcation point to understand the layout of the island and really understanding where the north end starts and ends when you get into the more of the midtown area. Speaking of important roads, it's so interesting to learn that North County Road wasn't always where it is today. It used to really run along the oceanfront. It did, and it was moved because multiple hurricanes washed it out, first in 1926 and in, then in 1928. It was the property owners who owned along the oceanfront that petitioned the town to relocate the road from along the ocean to County Road. After the 1928 hurricane, three influential families, the Stotesburys, the Munns, and the Phipps, petitioned the town to abandon North Ocean Boulevard. They agreed to pay for the widening of Palm Beach Avenue, which is today known as North County Road, from 30 feet to 70 feet. They also established a fund to beautify the street when the work was completed, the newspaper declared that it would be one of the most beautiful thoroughfares in Palm Beach County. And I think almost everyone who travels down that road today would agree with that statement. When we talk about historic preservation, we often think of historic buildings, but there's actually so much more that goes into creating a sense of place like the one found here in Palm Beach. And I think that's why we're recognizing these historic landscapes. When we look at our streetscapes today, it doesn't just consist of one house. It consists of a whole street of houses along with the landscaping around it. And that really brings us to the idea of a cultural landscape, which is when we talk about every single part of the landscape, neither the natural nor the built environment as separate entities, but all together as one. And that dovetails so nicely into why we're doing this episode today. We can't think of the natural and built environments as separate entities, because there are things that we know now about how the built environment impacts the natural environment, and specifically related to these two historic landscapes, we know that one is comprised of an invasive species of plants, and the other one is impacted by an invasive insect. I think exploring these topics in preservation is really timely because we're really at a pivotal moment where we kind of have the environment 
at the forefront of our building challenges. There is sea level rise, there is invasive plants and invasive species that are impacting our built environment today. So it's so important for us to be leaders in understanding how these all can work together to save the places that we love. I think that's so correct. And even though we may not have all the answers right at this moment, the important thing is that we're having this conversation. This episode of Landmarks Discovered provided the perfect opportunity to sit down with our Director of Horticulture, Susan Lerner, to talk about the importance of native plants, the impacts of using non-native plants in our historic landscapes, and how we can be more mindful about our landscape choices in the future. Even when I got to Pan's Garden, Pan's Garden, although it had been established as a native botanical garden, had kind of slipped away from being 100% native. And I know that if you show people native plants, they will love native plants. If you show people exotic plants, they will love exotic plants. People will love what you give them. People will find beauty if you give it to them. According to the Institute for Regional Conservation, there are eight different ecosystems on this barrier island of Palm Beach. Starting with beach dunes and coastal grasslands at the ocean, going to the coastal berm, the coastal interdudinal swale, the coastal strand, which is comprised largely of saw palmettos, the freshwater tidal swamp, the maritime hammock, a lot of the plants in Pan's garden are from the tidal hammock, the maritime hammock, and the tidal swamp, which includes plants like the black mangrove, the buttonwood, which are found on the Lake Worth side of the island. Two examples of Palm Beach's historic landscapes include Wells Road and North County Road. On Wells Road, there's an alley of invasive Australian pine, and North County Road has an alley of Ficus benjamina, which attracts the invasive whitefly. When the Australian pines were planted, they were kind of the tree du jour. They were at the Everglades Club. They were an interesting plant that could block the wind, and people didn't really understand that they were invasive. I don't think there was a, even a thought about invasive. So in preparation for this segment, I went and visited both locations, and they really don't look so good. The trees are overgrown on Wells Road, and the, the ficus are thinning out. Whitefly is really having its day. There are Australian pines planted throughout Palm Beach from that era, and others, I'm sure, that have planted as, in, as invasives. But the plants that are seen in the, photo, the postcards that accompanied this designation report are very finely cropped trees. And so when the trees are taken care of and finely cropped like that, they are less in, in, inclined to produce seeds. But if you, look at, if you look at Wells Road today, the trees are large, and there are seed, seedlings on the top of them. And those trees on Wells Road today are invading other areas we just don't know where. What happens to these seedlings, whether they're from, whether they're from Wells Road or Mar-a-Lago or wherever these Australian pines are, they're landing in other places. When I was talking with Richard Moirud, the botanist at Bingham Island, he was complaining that he's having to pull out new Australian pines almost on a daily basis. Several years ago, investment was made in Bingham Island, the island just south of the Southern Bridge, to create a bird sanctuary. Invasive species were taken out. Native plants were added that belonged there historically. And now it's a thriving bird community. However, until we manage our invasive species and eliminate our invasive species, the work on Bingham Island will never be done. The work all over Florida will never be done. It'll be a constant challenge and a constant drain of money. The story of, of invasive plants in Florida starts in 1884 when a woman from Florida was visiting the exposition in New Orleans and brought home a couple of buckets of water hyacinth, put them in her pond near the St. John's River. Those hyacinths expanded rather quickly and so she took the extras and moved them to another, her boat landing in the St. John's River and the rest is history. But the history took a long time. The, the St. John's River was impassable and in 1970 was the first time anything was done about it. In 1970, the Florida legislature established the Bureau of Aquatic Plant Research and Control, and thus began how we manage invasive species. 
1984, a hundred years after the introduction of the water hyacinth, Florida established the Exotic Pest Plant Council, the first in the nation, and it actually set the bar for other states to follow suit. It happened here in Florida. And it happened because of Melaleuca, Australian pine, and Brazilian pepper. We have developed so much of the United States and so much of Florida that there's very little natural space left for the species of the world, our fellow earthlings, if you will, to, to live and thrive. In Doug Tallamy's latest book, Nature's Best Hope, he calls out to us as nature's best hope. It's up to us to plant our gardens and our yards and our schools and our businesses and our parks with native plants to give a home to all of these species that otherwise will eventually go extinct without us. And as we're approaching this time of modernizing Palm Beach, this is the perfect opportunity to replace those trees, all of those trees. But let's replace those trees in, in a forward-thinking manner. Let's not preserve the past at the expense of the future. My suggestion would be use the green buttonwoods that Ibis Isle has used. They'd be a perfect canopy there. This episode is really great because it opens the door for further conversation about the impact of our historical landscape. And we'd love to hear from you in the comments your thoughts on how the landscapes are today and what we might need to do for them to be sustainable in the future. Thanks for joining us for Landmarks Discovered. I hope you'll join us next month when we visit another historic place in the town of Palm Beach.